I'm Dean Newland, and welcome to the Business of Intuition, where I coach, facilitate, train, and speak on the hard science and meaningful experience of intuitive leadership in business, so you can make better decisions, forge real connections, and creatively solve problems to amplify your impact and simplify your life. Welcome to the Business of Intuition. There's a wisdom found in teams that can outshine the wisdom of individuals. A wisdom created by a clear contract by members as to why they need to come together and be a team. And if they can't, well, then let's just go back to our individual work. A wisdom that says trust is built while doing the work, not before. A wisdom generated from team intuition, those hard to articulate gut feelings that can result in better decisions. You know, so many times when we hear the word teamwork, we think of a behavior like collaboration, treating people with respect, being trustworthy, engaging in healthy conflict. My next guest on the business of intuition is a specialist in building teams. He starts with the end in mind. What are we trying to accomplish? Then let's organize around that. Then in the process of doing the work, let's strengthen those interpersonal behaviors that will help us sustain our efforts. Carlos Valdez Dapina is a team building brother from a different mother. We both started off as actors and then we learned all about motivation and what made people tick. We got pretty good at leading groups and facilitating and teaching. And we both became coaches. And even though I never met Carlos before this episode, we did go somewhat different paths. I mean, we both worked uh, in consulting for years, but he actually spent many, many years inside of large organizations like Mars and IBM. He has written two books on teamwork. Lessons from Mars, How One Global Company Cracked the Performance Code Around Collaboration and Teamwork, and one that I think is really timely given our situation, Virtual Teams, Holding Center When You Can't Meet Face-to-Face. -face. Both books are based on original research Carlos conducted during his 17 years as an internal consultant at Mars, and he is the founder of Corporate Collaboration Resources. All right, wonderful. Well, Carlos, I am so very grateful that you are here on the business of intuition. I think your topic around teams, especially in our day of having to be uh, in virtuality is really important, but I want to get to that, to that shortly. You know, you've got a great background. You work for some wonderful companies. Uh, you've written a couple of books, but personally, why are you passionate about teamwork? What is it that got you wanting to go down that path versus be hell, a professional bowler. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, what is so it about sense. teams that, why, why do you wake up in the morning going, why, why, is, that your, why is that your thing? You know, it, it, I, I backed into it, Dean. As, as so often happens in life, it's serendipity, right? I was trained as an organizational consultant. I got my second master's degree in organizational consulting. My first one, by the way, is in acting. So that, that's another for another day. Oh, we've got to talk about that in a second, but we'll come back okay. to that. Okay. All right. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I was doing this work at Mars, doing kind of generic, a lot of change management, a lot of organization design, org effectiveness, some leadership and executive coaching. And they asked me to look at working with Mars leadership teams. We were paying external consultants a lot of money to do this work. And I had a background in it academically and had some and people felt I was good at it. I had done a few sessions here and there and they thought, eh, let's give this guy a try. Maybe we can save some money because we're paying these externals a, just a truckload of money every year. I said, sure, let's give it a go. Yep. And that got me started. Now, I was having a blast and I really felt quite adept at it. I just felt like I was in the right place. Mm. I, I would find myself in flow, mm. the term that gets thrown a lot around a lot these days, I guess, yep. and has for some time now. But anyway, it was deeply satisfying, inherently interesting to me, and people valued the work, right? So there was, it was a win, win, win. And I had to ask myself, why is that? 
I, I honestly, and I'm not sure, Dean, that I have the answer to this day. I'll mention a couple of things. Yeah. One, I am one of 11 children. I'm the middle child of 11 children. Mm. So I grew up in an environment. <laughs> I like to think of it as a, as a giant open office environment, but in a family um, where I had no privacy, where I always had to deal with my siblings, older, so you, younger. You grew up in a team. I grew up, yeah, you know, somewhat sort of. dysfunctional, but, <laughs> but a team. Got but it, the, the key it. to that was making your way, th everything had to be negotiated. Hmm. Everything had to be done with others. There was no, I'm just going to, I mean, there was, I could, I, I didn't even have a room to myself for most of my growing up, right? As, as I got older, we got a bigger house. But I think, I think that family background, and my wife was the one who really suggested this, I think that laid a foundation. I think my work in theater definitely created a comfort with working in complex collaborative environments because as i have looked at some of your bio the theater is a place of collaboration you an actor doesn't get onto a dark stage without some kind of sound equipment or set or lights or direction or other actors we're constantly working with others and i also learned there about story i think every hmm. organization has a story to tell that's my how i think about strategy What's the story we want to be telling about ourselves? What's the story we want to create in the world? So that contributed to it. And finally, I think it's about relationship. I very much an introvert. Even and, though you're in theater. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think that's not unusual actually for actors. They need, right. they need to go into that quiet place from time to time. But um, probably it's also why I wasn't a very good actor. <laughs> I was too much in myself, but anyway, um, I find that we all have to work for a living. And several years ago, before I got into consulting and was trying to figure out what I wanted to do, I was really lucky to be at that point in a small entrepreneurial firm in New York City, loving the work. It was a photography agency back before the days of the internet when commercial stock photography agencies actually had to have tens of thousands of images in their file cabinets available to people who wanted them, right? But anyway, it was a small company. It was a, a new industry at that time. And I was having a blast. And I would go to parties on the weekends and hear my friends complain about their terrible bosses or their terrible jobs. And I was having just this incredibly good time. There's so, and I thought we spend so much of our lives at work, we should all be enjoying work, we should all be getting something out of it. And those wonderful relationships we create, right? It was the people. Yeah. And that was when this goes back to the early 90s, when I said, that's what I want to do, I want to make work a place where we can be fully ourselves, and have great productive relationships with others. And, and mm. that I, I look, mm. I, I zigged and zagged from that point, no, it's it's by no, no means a straight line. But those are the elements I think that contribute to it. You can see I've thought about this maybe too much. No, no, but it's good. And I so there's so many things popping into my head here. But one, I've got a background in theater and acting as well. And one of the things that I noticed is a as a student of theater and a student of acting, I was able to kind of get into the visceral body of another person to understand motivation because that's mm -hmm. what your character development had to be about. And I know that in your writing, you talk about motivation as being very important on the individual level as it as it right. relates to the purpose of the team. When you think about um, all of the books out there that are about teamwork, and it's a conversation that people, of course, like us externals, get all the time about how do we build an effective team? What, where do we go wrong? What's missing that your voice is filling that gap? So this was a fairly recent discovery in my life. I was using traditional approaches to team effectiveness and team building for decades. And I was at Mars and I was in my second or third year of doing this. And I just wasn't satisfied that we were getting results, that the work I was doing was making a difference. It felt good in the moment. This was a lot of trust and relationship based work. Okay. It's mm -hmm. very much about helping teams get to know each other better. My training at the American University where I got my master's in org development was all about what's your Myers-Briggs, what's mine? Mm -hmm. What's your FIRO B? If anybody out there knows what the FIRO mm -hmm. B instrument is, right? Let's talk about that and let's build a relationship. And I was doing it and in the moment it felt good to people. Mm -hmm. They were glad to be connecting. They'd been working so hard. They were really starved of, 
of the relationship part of it to a certain degree, even though they were in quotation marks working together. But it didn't last. A week later, they'd be back at the office or back at the factory and they'd be going flat out and all that work we did in relationship kind of vanished. Hmm. Um, and it wasn't making a difference to the outcomes of the team or the group. So when I started to dig into this, let me cut to the chase. What I learned was trust is a valuable component of team effectiveness, but it is not the foundation. So this is very different from what a Patrick Lencioni might say. Exactly. Got to have trust first. Five dysfunctions of the team model for those who don't know what we're talking right. about. Right. That's and his foundation this... is trust. Right, right, yeah. exactly. There's, right. This, there's this base and you got to go from there. Right. Think, now let's talk, you and I for a moment, I hope this isn't off-putting to, to your listeners, no, but let's please, think, about it, th think about theater for a minute. Yep. You show up as, a, as an actor who's making a living, at this, getting a paycheck, you show up on day one. If you're lucky, you might go around the room and everybody introduce themselves, but basically you're going to do a table read or you're going to get up on stage, do a couple of read-throughs. You're just going to go to work. You're going to jump in. Right. And by the end of that production, I was working in regional theater, so these things always have a, a, a finite life. You really got to know people. You really trusted people. You really came to appreciate them through doing the work together. Hmm. And I thought that's really interesting. There's something in that. So all this work I was doing saying, oh, don't do the work yet. Get to know each other. I turned it on its head to get to know each other through meaningful work that requires you to commit together to the outcome you want to create. Watch how that, if you do it mindfully and consciously, that creates the most powerful relationships in the world. And therefore, it, 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 you're collaborating your way to trust rather than trusting your way to collaboration. Nice turn of a phrase there. Please tweet that. But I love what you just said. So that's where you, when you talk about in some of your writing around creating that contract, creating that, that purpose regarding the, the work that we're here to do. And then through that work, we end up developing trust. How do you layer the two? I mean, one could say, Carlos, I get it. I've been in many companies. I've been in different teams. I've got they, the boss and so on have given us our marching orders. We know what we're supposed to do, but I yeah. still hate these SOBs. Yeah. We're still not communicating. We, have crucial, we don't have crucial well, conversations. We don't get work done. We actually are getting in the way of that. We have focus. Mm -hmm. We don't have trust. How do you answer that? First of all, I don't, again, I don't dismiss trust as an element of effective teams. I submit that it is the product of, of working together. Now, the problem most teams run into is they're used to talking about teams the way their organizations and their senior leaders talk about teams, which is it's an attitude. There are mm. posters on the wall that say teamwork. There is no <laughs> I in team. Uh, yeah. you tick on down the list of, yeah. of, of hackneyed phrases, right? Yeah. Teamwork is this general mindset kind of approach. And by the way, everything is talked about as a team. The global R&D function of 75 people, we're the R&D team. The six people slaving away in the finance department in the back corner, they're the finance or the bookkeeping team. Right. We, we, it's so imprecise. And what I invite teams into is to create precision on what do you mean by teamwork? What actually requires teamwork and do, what doesn't? And the first question I ask, and I think this will resonate with you is, so let's assume that there, your collaboration will create value. What's the value of that? How does your, let me ask the question differently. How will your collaboration create value over and above the sum of your individual efforts. Got it. Got mm -hmm. it. Yep, if yep. that, if you can say, we have an answer to that question. We know how working together will do it. We know why the pain in the neck that collaboration can be is worth it. We know why it's worth it. We've defined that what I call collaborative purpose or collaborative value prop. Then suddenly working with you becomes less of a challenge. If I, you and I don't necessarily jive but we both know we have a shared purpose we know the big thing here is bigger than both of us yes and it it makes it doesn't necessarily make it easy but it makes it easier for people to set aside differences that they consider to be troublesome and say let's just ground ourselves in what did we say matters here hmm. so there's that you so at some point if you don't define why it's worth it because you know collaboration is messy it's, it is prone to conflict. 
It takes more time. It takes more communications and more emails and all down the list. It had darn well better be worth it. The other side of it is when you're just making that call, here's the where collaboration matters and the work that is worth collaborating on. You're also deciding what we don't have to collaborate on. You're saying, you know what? These five things over here, individuals can do themselves. It's so liberating. All of a sudden, I don't have to think everything is teamwork and team all the time. And I'm a good team player and you're not a good team player. It's collaborative work, non-collaborative work. Okay, this is good. I, okay. I, I'm so glad we're doing this. This is just right up. I mean, I feel like I got a kindred spirit here. So thanks for showing up. So sure. um, Sam, I think it was Sam Walton said once that people behave in the area in which they are measured. We have so much focus right now around, you know, engagement scores in organizations. Let's do an annual pulse survey and every two years we'll do a bigger one. And we look to that and we see that as being really important and all that gets disseminated out to each team member and they go, hey, our collaboration scores went up 15%, yay. So we're measuring something that I suppose some would say valuable, but what do we need to do? What's the measurement tool that will help change behavior so that we're focused on the right things that you're talking about? Is there such a thing? It, 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 there has to be, Dean. And I, I, I was th last night asking myself the same question. So mm -hmm. I have a couple of instruments I've devised to use with groups to assess their behaviors relative to what I know will actually lead to collaboration. So those behaviors have to do with clarifying the strategic need for, for the work they'll do together then clarifying their team purpose. Do, have they worked on it? Have they asked themselves the question about how will our work create value over and above the sum of our individual efforts? Then have they identified the individual tasks or pardon me, the discrete tasks and projects that will feed that collaborative purpose and which ones don't need to feed the collaborative purpose and therefore can be done individually. I've been looking at it like that, right? So here are the, the sort of actions and steps, uh, the teams that are, taking an effective approach seem to utilize. I Good. think there's so, probably more there. I don't have the definitive answer. I right. haven't done, I haven't run validity and, and reliability tests on my <laughs> survey yet. No, but I love the idea. I think that's it's right. such a so great I, thing I, For me, it's, be, it's behavioral. I, it's gotta be stuff I can see in action. So for right. that, I, one last point, I know you wanna ask a question, but- No, 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 go ahead. I then, by the way, I go through that stuff about creating the clarity about, collaboration, what's the work, what's not the work, what's the purpose, then we'll sit down and we'll say, okay, if that's the work, and if that's our shared purpose, how are you and I going to play this? Mm. Then we start having the Myers-Briggs disc mm. conversations and using that as data to make our working relationships that much more effective. And oh, by the way, not only does it inform those conversations about how we work together, it's, it's stickier. I'm going to remember your Myers-Briggs much more easily because you and I have sat down and actually contracted around it, using that as just data for what will, what will smooth the way for our collaboration. So are there certain levels in an organization where you find the ability to collaborate around this idea of shared purpose? Why are we doing this more difficult than others? Meaning, I was thinking about a book by a guy named John Kotzenbach, which you, maybe you've yeah. read. Oh yeah. You mm -hmm. know, there's one, this Wisdom of Teams, great book which in a sense speaks a little bit about what you're talking about, you know, defining why we're here and then let's back into it. You know, we may not be a, a real team. We might be just a work group. That's okay. Let's not right. confuse the terms. But he also talks about teams at the top, meaning that this idea that the higher up you go, you've had so much training leading, you don't have much training and experience being a member of a team. What's your take on that? Is it harder to be a team even with your model, when you get further up in the organizational stratosphere? I think the heart, well, there are a couple answers to that. I think it depends on the organization. So I've worked at IBM and I've worked at Mars, two very different companies. Yeah. IBM was, um, most of the companies we, worked in, we work in are patterned on a Western organizational model, which actually goes back to the day of the Roman legions, right? It's a leader and a team under that, and then each team member has the team under them, and it's very much that traditional hierarchy. Yeah. Uh, IBM was very much that way, and it was a very political organization, and so collaboration was very difficult 
at, at the high, at anything from the middle to the high levels, because people had too much at stake as individuals. Hmm. Every organization I know of pays individuals, they, they hire individuals first, then they pay them as individuals, then they reward them as individuals, and they promote them as individuals. So He's that's, right. that's right, kind right. of baked in, right? Yeah, yeah. IBM, it was sort of extreme. Mars was a more collaborative organization. So you got higher up, but I'll tell you what happens at that high level. Here's a number for you. When I did an informal study at Mars of how many teams the average Mars manager slash director was on, what do you think that number was? Oh man, I'm gonna guess much more than one, probably more like four or five. Six, 6.2. 6. 6. 2. 6. Right. 2. <laughs> and the higher you go up, the more teams you're on. I believe it. Right, because you're on this task force and that steering committee and that special project, then you're the, you know, the stakeholders, the shareholders have asked you to run this program. It's insane. And so collaboration is all you get and the need to feel. So you've got all these, all these things pulling at you, not just your direct reports looking to you to lead, but teams looking to you to contribute. It's a tough spot to be in. And so it is harder, but I'll tell you what works brilliantly is when you sit down with the team you're with that day in that particular two hour time slot and you say, guys, can we just talk for a minute? why do we need to be a team? Because I'll mm. tell you what, I got seven other teams I need to go be with. Mm. And if we can't create a value proposition for this team that's compelling for me and all of us, you'll forgive me, but I'm going to go do other stuff. Right. And driving those conversations, I get a lot of traction with that. That's awesome. All right. So I'm going to ask you, I'm shifting a gear here. Um, yeah, yeah. So I was talking to a CEO last week and he was saying, you know, Dean, when Vietnam hit, we had all these vets come back and we were witnessing the, this very odd and unknown level of stress. They were coming back uh, depressed. Um, they were really having a hard time getting back into society. And we, later, we called it PTSD. And his perspective is that we don't even have a term for the kind of stress that we're going on right now with this whole COVID situation. And, um, and then you add all the other things that are happening regarding technology and the speed of that infiltrating our life and one could speak on that for days yeah. so you know is the is the is the pace of change the pace of stress that we're experiencing with covid just sort of the the canary in the mind of what's more to come oh boy doesn't that sound uplifting i think i want to turn off this podcast right now right but let's just assume that that some of this stuff is is really kind of this evolution that human beings are trying to connect to and and to uh, catch up to in the virtual world where we're now doing Zoom and WebEx meetings, and that might go on for a long time. Some organizations are not coming back until the third quarter of 2021 in terms of bringing people back. How do we stay, how do we build teams when we can't see the whites of each other's eyes? How do we do it virtually? And I know you've got a book on it. Can you give us some of your main points in the environment and the context we're in? Well, I think the first thing we have to do, Dean, is we have to acknowledge it just isn't going to be the same. We just have to own that. Yeah. I, I use the word surrender. We have to surrender to that reality. It's not going to be the same. But what then ask, so what can we do? And I go back to a word I used earlier when I was talking about what got me into this, and it's meaningfulness. Hmm. If what I'm doing, whether I do it virtual or I do it in the room with five other people, if that feels meaningful to me, it'll feed my soul, right? We need our souls fed desperately. And so it, it, for me, that points directly back to this, the word purpose I've talked about. What is the purpose of this? These, I was just on the phone today with a financial advisor person, and she was talking about her level of exhaustion, zoom to zoom to zoom to zoom through the day. And it is, it's tiring. Yeah. My, the the three-day offsites I would lead with senior teams where, I mean, it was 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. for three solid days. They were less exhausting than this stuff. Agreed, yes. So figure out where the meaning is. What's the work that's most meaningfully demanding of your time and energy? and dedicate your time to those things and only those things. Create space in your day to be away from your computer, to do the work that isn't collaborative. And then where it is, it's more important than 
at any other time to define that meaningful work that speaks to your motivation, right? So we'll get back to that work for a second. One of the insights I had from my work at Mars was that people weren't collaborating because they were simply more motivated to do their individual work. They were motivated by their paycheck. They were motivated by their boss saying, hey, this isn't your performance management plan. You better get on it, right? They were demotivated to collaborate, partly because it's more complicated and it's messier and they could get the results they needed more easily doing it themselves. But some of this work just has to be collaborative, not all of it. The stuff that's going to get your attention is the stuff that speaks to you, that motivates you, that is meaningful for you at a gut level, not some brainiac, it's, it, it, it's logical and rational, therefore I should do it. It's got to feel important. And so that's, what I go, that's where I go in the book. I say the first thing to do is, and I talked about that in the book as holding the center for the team. What is, your, the, what is that thing that grounds you all together as a unit with a shared intention and with shared outcomes, go there and keep anchoring yourselves in that. It's never going to be as rich as us being in a room together and rolling up our sleeves and mm. co-creating something spectacular, but we can still get satisfaction from it and limit the strain and stress of the reality of remote work by ensuring that the time we spend doing it is spent on the right things, the stuff that has meaning for us and that'll get us where we need to go. So if we have that kind of focus and that clarity, are you mm. saying that that can help feed the soul that needs to be fed in a virtual environment with this whole lockdown that's going on? And I've got kids that I have to do some work with because they're staying at home and <laughs> I'm multitasking yeah. all over the place. So for the family, so let's, let's be, let's ground this in some data for a minute. 40% yeah. of us roughly are working from home. Okay. 60% um, of us still have to go into the restaurant or the factory, right? Or to the beauty parlor where we work. Yes. Um, and some of us, some of those people would actually like to work from home. Mm -hmm. Of that 40%, some percentage of them are facing what you just described, the kids, the homeschooling, and all of that. But the most recent study I read suggested, and then of course the others are either living alone or living with a partner, right? Mm -hmm. In a space by themselves. So not everyone shares the same stressors. Correct. Yeah, and then about half of those people, half of that 40% say, I like this. Yes. I'm actually feeling better about working this way. And then the other half are saying, eh, I think I wanna get back to the office as soon as I can. Yes. So there is no solution that will fit all of those people with all of their varied circumstances. All I'm suggesting is that look at what we have control over. I can't control whether my kids go back to school or not. Hmm. I, have no, I, mean, I can go speak at the, at the virtual school board meeting, but right, just it's, it's a voice, one voice. Hmm. When it comes to the part of my day that I can actually control, and by the way, my kids are grown and out of the house, so I consider myself blessed that I don't have to deal <laughs> yeah. with this, but they have small kids, right? Yeah. And we're helping yeah. them manage that. So yeah. I have that experience. In my day, what I control is what I do from whenever my day starts to whenever I take my next break, when I go deal with the kids, and then when it starts again, I take those chunks I can control and I try to focus that where it's going to be most meaningful and powerful. So at least at the end of the day, Dean, I can say with the bit of my day I had some control over, I feel like I did something worthwhile. Yeah. I can lay my head on my pillow and go, yeah, maybe I didn't get it all done, but the parts where I had influence or control, I did okay. I did okay. So Carlos, I'm trying to bridge a couple of last things here. Um, yeah, sure. That I'm not sure, quite sure how to, to phrase this question, but I, I love your perspective on this clarity, this purpose, this reason, this contract. And I have a proposal that I wanted to see how you respond to it. Because I understand sure. that you're saying that, you know, that doesn't mean that we still don't work on trust and we don't go through Miles Brings and all that other stuff. That's, but we have to have it in context towards something that binds us together, this purpose. Mm -hmm. I'm, I, I'm fascinated by a lot of things regarding teams and, and leadership. And one of them has to do with intuition and how people can tap into mm -hmm. this sometimes non-data centric knowing that will allow full engagement in a conversation or could be a way of creatively solving a problem. But 
if a culture doesn't support that, I got to keep my mouth shut. Does the clarity of purpose help or hinder a person's ability to tap into that maybe non-data centric knowing that one might call intuition? Does it give us context? Does it help us open up to more of who we are and to participate and collaborate more because now we sort of know our direction. I guess it's sort of a rhetorical question, but I want to sort of sense and get your feeling for that. Well, I, I think you raise a really interesting area to look at. So I tend to be a fairly intuitive person, right? I just, it's just how I'm wired. Um, in in uh, Myers-Briggs, somebody might say I have a, a big N. Yeah. Um, but it, it's, it's, I rely on my intuition to get my work done. All the data comes in and I let it process at a completely non-conscious level. And what comes out may sound intuitive, but in fact, it's coming from some place in me that I don't fully understand. I'm a big believer in the power of individual intuition, especially where leaders are concerned. I think leaders have to know their guts, right? Mm -hmm. I think they have to know what's going on in here. I think mindfulness for leaders is an indispensable practice mm -hmm. so that they can know what's noise and they can know what's signal, if you know what mm -hmm. I mean. Mm -hmm. Is there such a thing, and I'm making a leap here, Dean, as group intuition? Is there a place where we come together as a group and we have intuitions about what's right? Yes. About where to go, what choices to make. My experience has been that that is absolutely true. When I get engaged groups in these purpose conversations, and I'm thinking one in particular in Australia with a group, and they were coming out of a wrenching change, lots of layoffs, very difficult for their people. And they were carrying some of that burden emotionally. What could they be? What was their purpose? And they didn't come up with words. They came up with an image of a lighthouse. Hmm. Somebody drew this on a sticky note and put it on the wall. And I said, that, that's what we need to be, guys. Hmm. There is no data for that. And what that, that, that created, uh, a unity in that group. They they rallied around that quietly. It was mm -hmm. like you could see their bodies just step towards the wall and go, wow, mm -hmm. that says a lot about how I need to lead and how we as a group need to lead. I believe it's there. I talk about mysterious, right? Yes. <laughs> I don't know how to describe it, but right, right. I, I think it I think it's something that uh I love that you brought it up really, because I think it's wow, what an interesting way to start thinking about the identity of a group. Do you think groups have identity? They have personalities, if you will. Why wouldn't they have intuition? Well, I agree with you. I do think there's individual and there's group intuitions. And there's stories, of course, that I could share that reflect the same idea that you just had. And I think that the, that the clarity is really part of what are the things that can open that up. Yeah. Um, that, that door starts to, to creak open. And all of a sudden, now one person starts an intuitive idea. And then it starts to propagate and starts to grow. Mm. Um, and that really intuition is just a tool, you know. In it, and so what's the outcome of that tool? The outcome is wisdom. The outcome is information. The outcome is creativity. The outcome is unity. The outcome is purpose. The outcome is something we would do in a visioning session, right? That's, those are all outcomes, but it's, it's just a tool for a means to an end. It's, a, it's part of our consciousness or unconsciousness coming together to create something. I, I just love this discussion, Carlos. Tell people how we can connect with you your blog, your podcast, your uh, okay. books. I just want to make sure that everybody out there who is listening to this right. can gain more from you. Well, I, I thank you for that invitation to a broader public. My website, Carlos V. DePena. I won't spell that out. I'm, I'm hoping it'll be show up. Oh, yeah. Show well, it, it'll be in the show notes for sure. Carlos V. DePena.com is where you can find links to my podcasts, my blogs, the articles I've written. Uh, I am on LinkedIn, and if you're curious, look me up. It's my name, Carlos Valdez de Pena at LinkedIn. Um, I'm also in Twitter, although I have to be honest, I don't tweet very much. We, <laughs> the technology tweets stuff that I do elsewhere, and uh, yeah. so I'm present there, but it's not the best way to find me. Yeah, um, yeah, and then just uh, I'll tell you what, follow me on LinkedIn. I, I think that's where I spend, um, where I put a lot of my thought and where I test out new ideas and where I engage with people that I don't know. Uh, I love it. I love that, that, uh, that shared space to explore ideas. 
That's great. Well, I think your work is really very timely, very needed. I really see you as a thought leader in an area that we have typically thrown the word team building, teamwork mm -hmm. so ubiquitously across so many different conversations and we really don't know what it means. And I think you've added some clarity to that. And I think your work is so important, especially in this time. And so thank you so much for being a guest on the Business of Intuition. Yeah, been my pleasure and thank you, Dean. You're very welcome, this has been great. Thank you for tuning in to the Business of Intuition. If you enjoy what you heard, like this video and subscribe to our podcast channel. We publish and post our podcasts every week and if you'd like to hear all of them, go to our website, mfileadership.com forward slash podcast.